And so the question before us today is C.S. Lewis and the use of story as an apologetic. And I want to begin by asking why did Lewis write stories in the first place, such as his Narnian Chronicles, his science fiction, his novels, and so forth. And some have actually suggested that Lewis wrote stories because he was failed as an apologist. You've got people like uh, Humphrey Carpenter in his book, The Inklings, who underscores a debate that Lewis had on February 2nd, 1948 with Elizabeth Anscombe, the philosopher. Uh, he suggests that she was an eminent philosopher. In fact, this was the first paper she'd ever read after she had finished her doctorate. And that L Lewis, as a member of the Oxford Socratic Club, the founding president of the Oxford Socratic Club, would host this club during term time at Oxford, where one week maybe a believer would read a paper and the non-believers would respond. It was civil, generally. The next week, uh, uh, a non-believer would read a paper and the, no, uh, and the believers would respond and vice versa, it would go back and forth. And, and Anscombe was not a non-believer. She was a Roman Catholic, a practicing Roman Catholic and so forth. But she took issue with something Lewis had written in chapter three of Miracles on the use of the word valid. Could a materialist make a valid argument? And Lewis had argued that materialism itself wasn't a sound presupposition from which to argue in a valid way. And her point was, no, a materialist, while materialism is false, um, in fact, a materialist could make a valid argument beginning with a presupposition and through proper inferences come to a conclusion about some topic, any topic particularly even though their materialism might be false. And that was the nature of the debate. Well, Carpenter said that uh, she basically destroyed Lewis, and he wimped away from that debate and never wrote any more apologetics after that. Um, there are others as well. Peter Skakel, a renowned C.S. Lewis scholar, actually, in his book Reason and Imagination, echoes the same thing that Carpenter had said. Anne Wilson, in his C.S. Lewis, a biography, which is, by the way, the, the best written biography and probably the most inaccurate biography of C.S. Lewis. But it goes down very smoothly. He's a brilliant writer. And then, worst of all, is ja uh, Jack by George Sayre, who was a friend of Lewis's. I met Sayre many times. And, and Sayre actually said that Lewis had confided in him at breakfast a couple weeks after this debate that Anscombe had destroyed all his arguments for God's existence. Well, th there's, there's two things that are wrong with that. One, I'm sure Lewis never said it since he was present. And second, in Elizabeth Anscombe's collected papers, she published the essay. Anybody can read it. It's a matter of record. There was nothing about the arguments for God's existence in that particular essay. So consequently, George Sher must have made a major mistake at that particular moment, since the reality doesn't support his claims. But what is the reality? Did Lewis fail as an apologist? and consequently then turned to fiction as he wimped away from any kind of robust philosophical debate about matters of faith. The reality, again, is that the debate wasn't about God's existence, and consequently, that couldn't have been the fact. And as a matter of fact, Lewis did cease to write apologetics after this at one level. He never wrote a popular apologetic work as a, as a, as a book that he wrote as a book after that. That's true. But his three works in popular apologetics that were written before the debate wasn't all that he wrote in apologetics. There are 36 essays written by C.S. Lewis in apologetics before the debate and 34 essays he wrote in apologetics after the debate, essays. They were collected after he died and put together most of the essays that make up Christian Reflections, uh, God in the Dock, and Present Concerns are made up of those particular essays. And not only that, um, one of the essays he wrote shortly after the debate is an essay called Christian Apologetics, where he's instructing Christians how to do apologetic work. Hardly seems like the work of a failed apologist. <laughs> Furthermore, Lewis's first explicitly Christian book was the only allegory he wrote, and it's called The Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology for Christianity, reason, and romanticism. So the first apologetic work he used was a fiction, a work of fiction. He wrote Out of the Silent Planet before he wrote any of his popular, uh, uh, explicitly popular Christian apologetic books. And after he wrote that book, 
He said in a letter he wrote to a friend of his named Sister Penelope, the one who translated uh, Athanasius Incarnation of the Word of God, and Lewis wrote the introduction to that book. He wrote to her and said, most people have misunderstood my main point in Now the Silent Planet, and I have discovered that any amount of theology can now be smuggled into people's minds under the guise of romance. So it would appear that he saw fiction was a valid tool for the apologist all along. It was always a tool, I would say. And all the while he was writing popular apologetics, he was still writing fiction to a great effect at wooing people to faith. Screw tape letters, the great divorce, Perlandra, and that hideous strength. Lewis used story for many reasons, all of which can be helpful for the Christian apologist, and we can learn from him. First off, he used stories because he said he enjoyed stories and liked writing them. Um, I think if you're writing in an area where you enjoy the kind of writing you're doing, that's also helpful. He, he wrote in the preface to Paradise Lost, when a man writes a love sonnet, he not only loves a beloved, he also loves the sonnet. And so consequently, he uses that particular form because it carries the message best. He wrote an essay called Sometimes Fairy Stories Say Best What Needs to Be Said. And he would use a fairy story because he had a rhetorical goal. There, there was a biography that came out a couple of years ago by Alistair McGrath. And, 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 and McGrath, to his credit, read everything that Lewis wrote. You've got to give him credit for that. I'm not sure if he synthesized everything Lewis wrote, however. Second, McGrath writes very, very well. I use some of his books as textbooks at Wheaton College. But nevertheless, I think he missed Lewis completely because he looks at surprise by joy, and he does not understand Lewis's intent for that book and why Lewis used autobiography, autobiography as a literary form. And McGrath feels, as, as some have unfortunately written about Lewis's book, Surprised by Joy, that it was suppressed by Jack, that what Lewis was doing was keeping some stuff out that he didn't want to talk about. But Lewis says at the beginning of that book, his reason for writing it is to explain to people how he moved from atheism to Christianity. As soon as he gets to the place where he has come to faith, he stops the book. And by the way, because he's writing his autobiography, his autobiographical testimonial apologetics, trying to explain to people the barriers he needed to get over and how he found the object to this deep longing then that was the thing that helped him select the material of the teeming bits of information that made up his life, why he chose these details. McGrath says that he writes too much about his childhood school life, and he doesn't write enough about his war life, and certainly his life must have been messed up by uh, his wartime, because he reads the poetry of Siegfried Sassoon or Wilfred Owen or John McCrae and so on, and shows that these World War I poets were often so beat up. Why doesn't Lewis talk about this more? He arrives at the front on uh, November 29th, 1917. That was his 19th birthday. He's injured April 15th, 1918. That's uh, the end of November, we won't count that, December, January, February, March, mid-April, four and a half months. But he's in a hospital with trench fever for six weeks. He's only at the front for three months. So no, naturally, he's not going to write about that as much. But what does he write? What does he select from his World War I experience? He selects this, that he discovered G.K. Chesterton. That was important to his conversion story. That he learned to love the common man. That would be important even towards his uh, sense of um, uh, understanding how to communicate the faith in the vernacular. What does he write about his school days? It's long and extended, but his school years were longer. And he writes about this sense of isolation, this sense of, of being abandoned. His mother had died. His father whisked him off to some school. He was horribly treated there. He was uh, 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 really bullied in school in his school days. And it was speaking to the sense of his isolation and his longing for connection and so on. And so there were reasons for what he selected. Um, and I would suggest to you, too, as he turns to fiction, he's using it as a vehicle for particular things he wants to communicate. And he enjoyed writing them. He wrote, the imaginative man in me is older than the rational man and more continuously operative. He wrote that he enjoyed writing fiction more than he wrote uh, propositional work. 
Austin Farah, the Oxford philosopher and member of the Inklings with Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, Neville Cogill, and so on. Austin Farah said of Lewis, his supreme power was in depiction and his ability to craft metaphors and images to make his points stick. And if you've read even his apologetic work, something like Mere Christianity, look how he makes a point propositionally, and then he gives you an imaginative depiction of the point, and it sort of seals that. We grasp it. We get our minds around it. Evelyn Underhill uh, wrote, uh, praising him for his ability to make difficult theological points imaginable. Lewis was deliberate and thoughtful in his use of the imagination in image making. He would craft metaphors. He even writes in one of his essays that there are two kinds of metaphors at least. One is the pupil's metaphor. If I don't understand something, then from the place of understanding, I might say, well, it might be like this. And I cast a simile. I make a metaphor, an analogy. And I begin to explore it imaginatively. The other kind of metaphor is the master's metaphor. So this is a person who does understand the concept and crafts the metaphor to bring those who don't understand into the realm of understanding. You're teaching the junior high group at your church, and you craft some story or analogy so that they can understand it. But then he says there's another thing called transposition. And that is that there's always going to be the work of trying to bring people who don't understand into the place of understanding, and that work will never be done because we're talking about a transcendent realities. And we'll never get our minds completely around it. Now, let me give you a little depiction of that. In Lewis's own pilgrimage to faith, after he had reasoned his way through the morass of atheism, and after he had reasoned his way through its supporting materialism, and through agnosticism, and finally came to a theistic position, he said he didn't think he could know God personally any more than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. A year and a half later, he becomes a Christian, and he revisits that analogy. And he says, I realize that, in fact, my analogy was a good one. If Hamlet could never ever know Shakespeare, he couldn't break out of the play to get to know the author. But Shakespeare, the author, could have written himself into the play as a character of Shakespeare and made the introduction between Hamlet and Shakespeare possible. And he said, in fact, that's what happened in the Incarnation. OK, so are we done? No, there's the pupil's metaphor when he first champions it, the master's metaphor when he revisits it. But let's take a field trip. Let's go to Elsinore. And let's go back in time to the palace where Hamlet has grown up. And there's been some strange goings on. The king has died in the height of his strength. And rather than the crown going to the crown prince Hamlet, it's gone to the uncle Claudius. And Gertrude, the queen, hardly even grieving the death of her husband, has married her brother-in-law. And Hamlet's been acting kind of strange. Some have said they think that they've seen him talking to his father's ghost. But others have said there's a method to his madness. And Ophelia's a basket case. And we're walking through the courtyard talking about these strange goings on. And all of a sudden, there shows up in front of us this little man with Elizabethan tights, frizzy hair, an earring, and a goatee. And we say, who are you? And he says, I'm Shakespeare. You actually live in a world that I've created. And I know things have been kind of sketchy lately, but I've come to tell you it's all going to get better soon. And what do we say to him? Yeah, sure. No matter how much work you've done, there's always going to be a place where people might not get it, and you've got more work to do. Deeper depictions and so on. And we understand how that works. All growth and understanding, things that we do not yet understand, will require some exercise of the imagination. The scientists would tell us this. How does a scientific method begin? With hypothesis, an imaginative endeavor. How does it end after they do their exploration? They create models. They're not the thing itself, but they give us a depiction of what they've discovered and open the door then to the next set of hypotheses and so on. These imaginative depictions are not the thing itself. Consequently, they are of temporary value and even though very helpful at the time. I think the nature of truth demands this of us. Uh, all truth, all truth that we know can still be plumbed more deeply it can be applied more widely to questions we haven't even begun to ask yet. And it can be understood in some sort of coherent relationship with other truths. We hold any given truth with an open hand. Because the truth needs to be held with a level of humility, curiosity. There's more still to understand. 
wonder, and ultimately, I would suggest to you, worship. If I say to you, this is a pen, is that true or false? Are you sure? Maybe it's a laser pointer. <laughs> no, in fact, it is a pen. But what kind of a pen? Well, it happens to be a fountain pen. And not only that, we could study it further and find out it has a width, a length. It has, uh, uh, if Aristotle was here, a formal cause, a pattern after which it was made, a material cause, substance from which it was made, an efficient cause, a pen maker, and a final cause, a reason for which it was used, uh, how it writes on um, paper, how it writes on cardboard, how it writes on paper smeared with butter, not very well. <laughs> but we will, we, this is just a pen, and we're not going to get to the bottom of it. So consequently, again, these curiosities should be permitted ourselves in this sense of wonder and, again, ultimately worship. Lewis writes, reality is iconoclastic. What does that mean? An iconoclast is a person who breaks idols. So I have an image of God. I hear a great John Piper sermon. And consequently, I hear the sermon and some of the pieces of the puzzle come together for me. I read a book. I have a late night discussion with friends and so on. Well, as the pieces of the puzzle come together, it may take my breath away in that moment as my understanding is more robust. But that present understanding, if I hold on to it too tightly, it will compete against my having a growing understanding. And consequently, the image that was once helpful has now become an idol. And as Lewis writes, God in his mercy is always kicking out of walls of temples we build for him because he wants to give us more of himself. And that giving more of himself will require some continued imaginative exercise on my part. Um, let me see if I can flesh out this reality as iconoclastic a little further. And I think it's important because it is the biggest idea in Lewis's writings. Even his non-Christian works are filled with it. Um, Dimer, which is a fabulous poem that he wrote even before he was a Christian, all of the ideas that will be developed in his Christian life are in seed and question form in that work. And Dimer is a guy who's in this totalitarian state, and he's in a lecture hall. And Lewis writes that those who built this state tortured into stone the bubbles the academy had blown. There's the ideas, the images that have now become solid and, 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 and inflexible and not dynamic. And consequently then, he looks out the window and it's a spring day while he's in this indoctrination lecture hall and Lewis writes, who could ever legislate spring? And the reality of the real world breaks him out of this false world. And all the way through all of his books, I can take you to every one and show you where Lewis is talking about this idea. It's a driving force in his thinking, and I think a driving force behind some of his imaginative work, and I think a driving force that would be good for us as apologists to consider as we continue to niggle with the things that we're discovering and trying to describe to others so we can become gain more and more robust descriptions. A little aside here, I've talked with professors at other colleges and they've said, we're trying to get our students ready to face a postmodern world. And I go, well, you're preparing them for irrelevancy. The postmodern world's fractured. Go read After Theory by, by Terry Eagleton and so on. It's fractured. In my life, the big issue was existentialism. Then it was postmodernism. Everybody's going to go through two or three of these things. You want them to think through how they can think through any particular worldview that might be confronting to Christianity. You don't want to get them ready for one and then not be ready for what comes next. They need something more robust than that. So anyway, uh, some examples. Uh, Baron von Hugel, an author who influenced Lewis deeply. He was a philosopher of religion. He was also the spiritual director for Evelyn Underhill, another author who influenced Lewis. Um, Von Hugel, in his letters to his niece, wrote to her, beware of the first clarity, press on to the second clarity, and the third clarity. If there's deeper understanding to be gained, there will always be room for the storyteller in the apologetic world. Again, understanding the limits of story and what they can do and not expecting of them more than they can do. Okay, another one, Robert Browning, his poem, Rabbi Ben Ezra, a poem I read to my wife every year on our anniversary. It's the one that begins, grow old with me. The best is yet to be. But about line 30 of that poem, he writes, then welcome each rebuff that turns earth's smoothness rough. The earth isn't smooth. It has texture. It has geography. It has peaks. It has valleys. Welcome the thing that helps you to see it the way that it is rather than the way you would have to have it be. Tennyson, in his poem, In Memoriam, 
characterizes the same idea. He says, our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. Even the history of the councils of the early church would tell us that theology is approximation. And what we are constantly seeking are better and better approximations. And Augustine, in, in his confession, said, The house of my soul is too small. Enlarge it, Lord, that you might enter in. And then you get it in Acts 7, too. What, what's Stephen been accused of? He's been accused of speaking against the temple. And basically he gets up and he says, are you kidding me? You think you've got God up in that box up there? Don't you know that when God first appeared to Abraham, it was in Mesopotamia, hundreds and hundreds of miles from where that temple is. And when Joseph went down to Egypt, he wasn't abandoned. God went with him. And when Moses was taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep in the Midian wilderness, God showed up in the burning bush, way, way far away from where this temple is. And, and by the way, when David wanted to build the temple, God says, David, thanks a lot for the sentiment, but frankly, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. How will you build a temple that can contain me? And then what does C.S. Lewis do with Lucy, the most spiritually sensitive and therefore the most curious, the person whose heart is most filled with wonder and the person whose heart is quickest to worship, what does she discover on her second trip to Narnia? And she sees Aslan the Christ figure for the first time on that trip. She says, Aslan, you're bigger. He says, no, child, I am not. But every year you grow, you'll find me bigger. And if we have people whose theology is getting shut down to putting God in the box, we maybe will need story to waken them up and to bring them around. C.S. Lewis had 31 different ways to describe the imagination that I've counted in 40, I, I'm bad at math. This is 46 years of reading Lewis. I've found 31 different ways he uses the imagination. And some uses are good, like all thing human. Some uses are bad. Um, some of the good ones might be something like primary imagination. And he gets this from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And Coleridge talked about primary imagination, or he used a synonym for it, common sense. So we have five empirical gates that are bringing information in. We have sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. And all this information is coming. There's a world pulsating around us. But if you're focusing on what we're doing in this room, you're filtering out all kinds of data in order to concentrate on what's going on in this room. But how do you make sense of all of the information that's coming in. And the way we make sense of what's coming in is through the use of primary imagination, which itself is not an empirical uh, sense. And this is uh, an imaginative endeavor. It's an indicator of our ex the existence of our soul and something immaterial about us as well. There's the penetrating imagination. And Lewis borrows this from Shakespeare and from Dante. Shakespeare might have uh, one sonnet, and he might use seven different metaphors in that one sonnet to describe a single thing. He's trying to go deeper with it. Um, the same thing with Dante. He might use multiple similes in describing a single thing in the Divine Comedy. That's going deeper with the truth, imaginatively. There's a realizing imagination, which Lewis attributes to the medieval imagination. We have an idea in bud, and the realizing imagination opens up into wider applications and understanding of this particular thing. A tree doesn't have to uh, uh, give up its interior rings just because it adds more rings. But if it's not adding more rings, it's dead. Uh, the baptized imagination. Lewis gets this after he reads MacDonald's Fantasties, which I wish I had time to explain the story of Cosmo, chapter 13 of that book, which was the book that triggered this a baptized imagination. But, but basically in this, this type of imagination, Lewis is talking about the place where our imagination has, has, has pressing upon it something of the transcendent breaking in, and we're starting to grasp something, something supernatural is going on here. Now, MacDonald had said this. It would also be helpful to us. MacDonald, in his book, Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood, said, we do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. If you tell a child he has a soul, he thinks like anything else he has, his books, his keys, his coat, he could leave it behind while he goes off someplace else. Uh, if you tell him he has a soul, he thinks when, when he dies, 
Uh, he goes to the grave and his soul goes off someplace else. But he says, tell the child he is a soul and he has a body. He's not a Gnostic, but he has a body. But when he dies, he goes off to heaven and he leaves his body behind like clipped hair on a barbershop floor for those of you that still go to barbershops. Um, okay, so what, what, what makes up the soul? What makes up that immaterial part of us? Traditionally, people will say there is a choosing part, the volition. There is a feeling part, the emotion. There's a thinking part, the reason. I, I want to communicate to you, even coming from an academic environment, the reason is by far the weakest part of us. If I make a bad choice, my reason doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, that's stupid. There's going to be consequences for what you've just done. You should repent of that and get back on track. No, my reason being weak is marshaled by my will to make all kinds of excuses for that bad act, to rationalize it, for what the philosophers like Aristotle called akrasia or akrasia, or what Paul, uh, P, uh, Lewis talks about it, and again, Preface of Paradise Lost, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Or Paul says, we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. My reason is weak. If I'm hurt emotionally, my reason doesn't kick in and say, Jerry, you need to grieve what that person did to you. And you need to forgive them so you can untether from that person and not grow bitter. And you can sort of disassociate yourself from that particular thing. Uh, Anne Lamont, you know, she said in Traveling Mercies, bitterness is like you drinking the rat poison and then waiting for the rat to die. My reason doesn't tell me that. My reason may keep encapsulated on some cyst on my soul. All that pus building up. You bump into me, I bleed a little pus in your way. No, my reason is weak. And so consequently, because of this, Lewis says the reason can stand before the soul like dragon sentries, deciding what will get into that soul and into that place. And he writes, how do you get past dragon sentries? How do you get past watchful dragons? And he says, story sometimes does the trick. And all of us who read the Bible, we understand that. Because we've all read about David and his adultery with Bathsheba and his cover-up with murder. And you talk about acrasia, you talk about suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And Nathan gets the assignment. You've got to go tell David he sinned. Well, David's already killed one person to cover it up. I don't think I would like that assignment particularly. <laughs> but what does he do? He goes and tells a story. And the story gets through where the propositions would be less likely to do so. And David's able to hear, and it penetrates his soul. And sometimes story gets past watchful dragon. It's interesting that Lewis, uh, Lewis says sometimes, which also keeps us mindful of that, stories have their benefit, but it's not a universal benefit. Sometimes story might not be the best thing to use. Um, so there's baptized imagination. Bad uses of the imagination. The transforming imagination. He gets this from Wordsworth. It would be like the psychologist's use of projection. It becomes very self-referential. I never encounter the world as it is. I'm projecting on that world what I want it to be. And again, that bad use, I have to break through somehow. Idealized imagination. For Lewis, it's the opposite of the projecting onto a thing. It takes a concept and over eggs a pudding, so to speak, and it constructs a false world beyond myself. And similar is the generous imagination with its tendency to inflate a claim. I, I like to say to my students, OK, um, Prague is the most beautiful city in the world. Can I make that claim? <laughs> no. I, I like Prague, but why can't I make the claim? I haven't been to every city in the world, right? I haven't been to every city in the world. If I say, though, well, Prague's the most beautiful city I've ever seen, well, that might have merit, but what do you get to ask me then? What cities have I seen and what am I comparing it with? And if I say Barstow, California, that's not a good comparison. And my <laughs> statement, Prague's the most beautiful of those two, is, is not a very significant statement. But if I start listing many, many beautiful cities that I've seen in my lifetime, and I say Prague is the most beautiful, what now can you ask me? What's your definition of beauty, and how do you apply it to a city? And if I can't do that, then the statement is what Lewis would call generous use of the imagination. It's overstated. The best I'm reduced to is, well, I like Prague. <laughs> you know, 
But I need to make sure, especially as apologists, if I'm using story or if I'm even using proposition, I'm avoiding the overstatement. And I'm trying to say it as well as I might. And, and we're going to make mistakes, but then even own the mistakes and apologize and so on and get on with it. Uh, Lewis claimed that he was a rhetor. Um, uh, he, he said that in part because he was Irish. He had a natural inclination towards this. But the work of a rhetorician is to persuade. Uh, one author said every time Lewis put his pen to paper, he was trying to persuade his reader. Uh, if I ask you to vote for my particular candidate in the next election, I'm trying to persuade you rhetorically. But if I want you to pass the salt to me at dinner, I'm trying to persuade you. In other words, all rhetorician are persuasive or trying to persuade, and that means they're audience-centered. They're aware of an audience that's before them. And it has its risks because we can become manipulative, can't we? And if we become manipulative, that's bad. C.S. Lewis said, the worst of bad men are religious bad men. The quicker I might be willing to die for my faith, maybe the quicker I'd be willing to kill for my faith. Or paint a thus saith the Lord across my own opinions. I believe the Bible's inerrant. I am so squeaky conservative. I don't believe in word-for-word -word inerrancy. Because Jesus said not a jot or a tittle would pass away. So the tittle was like just a part of a letter. You know, if you start giving up and go over this word-for-word -word thing, next thing it'll be phrase for phrase, paragraph for paragraph. You know, who knows where that slippery slope's going to go. I am so squeaky conservative on this thing. But which text is inerrant, the pre-interpreted text or the post-interpreted text? And I believe it's a pre-interpreted text. My interpretation is, has to adjust itself to the plumb line of Scripture itself. So anyway, there's always the risk of manipulation. I need to be aware of that. Even as an apologist, I need to be aware of that. So how do we begin to do it well? Well, Lewis, in his essay on the English syllabus, a lecture that he gave at Oxford University to the students said, as a professor, a teacher, a, a don, an Oxford don, he said, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. We have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. Reality is something different from yourselves. Truth is not reality, people. Truth is what I think about reality when I think accurately about it. So consequently, my false statement has something by which it can be compared to be measured by. If it's false, I could adjust. There's no truth uh, supported by a false, uh, there's, uh, there's no reality that supports a false statement. So consequently, reality is the plumb line by which we ought to adjust the scoliosis of our mind, our will, our emotion, even our character. The art of the rhetor is to define, to describe, to depict, to help a person see reality with a little better clarity. Um, Lewis's approach, I think, was not to get face to face with the person and go after them. His approach was to get shoulder to shoulder with the reader and to define and to describe and to depict if he needed to. So that the person would see the thing itself and have their breath taken away by seeing reality as it was. And then consequently, if he moved away, this person's still in and interested and still willing to dig even after the uh, persuader, the rhetorician, has left the scene. Lewis said, in coming to understand anything, we must reject the facts as they are for us in favor of the facts as they are. He wrote that in the Experiment and Criticism, the epilogue. And he ends that epilogue with this statement. My own eyes are not enough for me. I would see what others have seen. I would read what they've written. Even that's not enough for me. I would read what they've imagined. Even that's not enough for me. I regret that the brutes could not write books. Gladly would I see how the world comes to the eye of a mouse or a bee, or how it comes charged to the olfactory sense of a dog. Wow, that's big stuff. OK, so that's, that's, that's why Lewis uses fiction, all right? It's not because he got beat up in a debate, and it's not because he doesn't see the value of the imaginative use and in its place in the whole apologetic endeavor. But let's look at a couple big themes, all right? We'll just look at two for the time we have, and then we'll throw it open for uh, questions and corrections, okay, in case you want to correct me. All right, big themes in Lewis's fiction. First, as Lewis's own longing for God was awakened through his reading, he seeks to awaken in his readers a longing and a hunger 
and a thirst for God. Uh, it might be that the critic or the skeptic of faith, uh, they've got these hard-bitten, robust, they think robust arguments that are contrary to any kind of revealed understanding of who God is and his place in our life. But sometimes the story awakens in a person a hunger. Even in Lewis's days when he was an atheist, he couldn't escape the hunger for God, the longing. He didn't know the proper object. He went through what he called the dialectic of desire. He would tether that desire, that longing, to one thing. It didn't fulfill him. He'd untether, tether it to something else. Wouldn't fulfill him. He'd untether, tether to something else. He says in mere Christianity, if I uh, find in myself a desire that nothing in this earth can satisfy, it doesn't mean the world is a fraud. But maybe it means the world is given to awaken the desire, not to satisfy it so it might set my heart pulsing for something more, something that transcends this world. And Lewis Discovering that in his own life was trying to be a servant of that kind of thing in his own writing as an apologist. So again, in The Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology for Christianity, reason, and romanticism, that book begins with a guy named John. And he sees a vision of an island off in the distance. And it sets him on pilgrimage. And in some senses, in, in, in that way, that particular book puts Lewis's book in, in, in the category of any pilgrimage book, any longing for home. G.K. Chesterton said we're homesick in our own homes. We long for home. We're pilgrims in our own land, Augustine said. And, and you get Virgil, right? Virgil's the Aeneid. And, and, and here is Aeneas, and he is a citizen of Troy, and the walls have been breached because they brought in the Trojan horse and the soldiers got out of the horse and opened up the walls while the Trojans slept, thinking that the Greeks had already left. And the city's being burned. And Hector, the crown prince who's died, his ghost shows up and tells, tells Aeneas, flee the city. Aeneas's wife, who's died that night, her ghost shows up and says, flee the city, go build a new city. And, and, and so here is... Aeneas leaving the city of his birth, Troy behind him as it's destroyed, and he's going with the vision to build the new city, Rome. The whole concept of romantic literature comes from that, that scene. Uh, he's going to build Rome. Uh, Virgil was trying to give the, the Romans the, uh, uh, and the Roman Empire a mythology for their city. And Augustine, who wasn't a fan of the myths, the ancient myths, he loved that one because he thought it depicted our real experience, that we are people caught between the two cities, the city of our birth and the city that will one day be. We read that book, and, 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 and Virgil wasn't a Christian, but he's writing something true about experience. We have this pilgrim longing for some place or some home, and John sets out on his pilgrim longing, and Lewis, very familiar with this literature, is trying to capture this. And John is caught between drifting towards the mountains, which is hard, bit, reason, rationalism, logic, and so on, or drifting towards the swamps that is romantic longing that, that, that is unchecked by reason and it's, it's swamp-like and, 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 and bad. And Lewis needs to find, John needs to find the balance between issues of the heart and issues of the head. Now there was a book that Lewis wrote called The Arthurian Torso, and he wrote it for his friend Charles Williams. Charles Williams had written this uh, poetry about the uh, Arthurian legend, and he wrote it through the eyes of the poet at Camelot, uh, uh, Taliesin. And, and the poetry is really, it's hard, hard, hard stuff to get through. And Lewis, when his friend Charles Williams died, felt an obligation to Williams, because there's brilliant ideas in this poetry, and so he wrote literary criticism of this poetry and it's this Arthurian torso, which is a brilliant book. A lot of people don't read it, but it's a really good one for you to, to, to uh, find and read. But there's a place in this book where Lewis says that Williams has this scene in his poetry that he takes from Wordsworth's Prelude, where this Bedouin shepherd is walking along with a stone in one hand and a shell in the other. And the shell represents these romantic longings. And the stone represents reason. And Lewis says in this book, interesting comment, the first problem in life is how do you fit the stone and the shell? How do you bring together the head and the heart? And the first book that he writes after he's a Christian, again, The Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology 
for Christianity, reason, and romanticism. Christianity brought them together in a holistic vision of life. And he uses a story to communicate that idea. And John, as he's traveling to find the, the, the fulfillment of his quest and the fulfillment of his longing, has to try to find the way between head and heart. Lewis is writing about this, but it's all this big idea. Uh, Lewis trying to awaken in his readers a longing for God. Another example of this would be uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, my, frankly, my favorite of the Narnian books. Well, let's, let's look at some examples of the quest for God in that particular book and how Lewis uses it to awaken in his reader this kind of longing. The book starts out, there once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. And Lewis knew that no boy deserved to be named Eustace Clarence Scrub, just as no boy deserved to be named Clive Staples Lewis. <laughs> and he didn't like his name. And when he was young, he told his parents, I'm Jacksy. And he went by Jack. Jack, Newspawn, right? There you go. He went by Jack. Did you guys name him after C.S. Lewis? Oh, he missed a great opportunity. <laughs> oh, yeah, your father, I forgot. Forgive me. Um, so he, he went by Jack. Anyway, he writes this book. There once was a boy named Eustace Clint Scrub. And you can almost feel a little bit of compassion on Lewis's part for this boy. But basically, Eustace Clarence Scrub is, is, is an archetypal brat. He has the heart of a dragon under the skin of a little boy. And by magic, he ends up in Narnia with his two young cousins, uh, Edmund and Lucy. And it's not long in the magic of that world where he ends up becoming outwardly what he always was inwardly. And he's just horrible, horrible kid. And there comes this moment where he sees a dragon dying. And he goes to where the dragon horde was. And he thinks he's got all these riches. And he looks in the pond. And when he looks in the pond, he sees a dragon hovering above him. And he thinks, I better get out of here. And he moves his right hand. And the dragon moves his right hand. He moves his left hand, and the dragon moves his left hand. And he realizes that the visage of the dragon is his own visage, and he has become outwardly what he's always been inwardly. Lewis uses that image of the mirror or the water. He uses it in Dimer. He uses it in, in, in uh, a Great Divorce, where he's talking about this, these despicable people who have come up from hell. He's had conversations, fight breaks out, and he's sitting next to somebody else on the bus, and another fight breaks out, and he sees somebody else. And then all of a sudden, after talking about these despicable people, he looks down the aisle of the bus, and he sees a window at the front of the bus, and he realizes he's one. He's one or rule until we have faces as she struggles with all kinds of things. And she's angry at the gods, shaking her fists. The whole book is her complaint against the gods. And all of a sudden, she looks in the pond and discovers she's everything that she doesn't like. And she has to see this. And Eustace sees this. And all of a sudden, oh, his heart breaks with the realization of his deep, deep need and things need to be set right. And you read that, and all of a sudden, if you're reading it open-heartedly, maybe you see some of your own things reflected in that particular moment. And you, with Eustace, longing to have uh, the brokenness fixed, find yourself on his same quest. And all of a sudden, there comes that moment when he goes back to the Dawn Treader and they all see a dragon coming, and they're sort of afraid, but they notice that there's tears on this dragon's face, and he awkwardly tries to scratch into the sand that he's used to. And they all come running up to him and love him. And he notices now that they were tender and compassionate all along, but he never saw it until he was in his awareness of his own ugliness and how tender these people were to him. Well, the ship had, had it, it passed through a storm, and they had, uh, the mast had broken, and there was a lot of... Uh, fixing that needed to be done, and now he's able to just go and look at a tree and knock the branches off it and knock it over and with his hot breath uh, skim off all the bark and put it in place. Flies over the island and gets a bunch of goats and stuff so they could revictual the ship. He flies over the island and shows them where sweet water is, and they get the sweet water, and now everybody's saying, okay, we're going to leave the next day. What are we, what are we going to do about Eustace? In the gray dawn moments of the day they were going to leave, Eustace comes walking back, boy again, into the camp. 
One of the people, one of the people on the Dawn Treader is there to greet him. We'll talk about him in just a moment. But Eustace tells a story that that night he went back to his dragon horde. And in the night, in the moonlight, a lion came. And Eustace says, I shouldn't have been afraid of the lion. I was bigger than the lion, but I was so afraid. And the lion spoke to me and said, you must undress yourself. And he says, yes, I realize. I'm a dragon. It's a lizard-like thing or a snake-like thing. I can just shed my skin and be boy again. <laughs> Tremendous effort. He sheds his skin and looks in the pond, and still he's dragon. A second time, ah, tremendous effort. He sheds his skin and looks in the pond and still he's dragon. A third time, he's frustrated. He can't fix what's broken. And all of a sudden, the lion says, I must undress you. And taking that lion claw, he goes through that dragon flesh all the way to the dragon heart and makes him boy again. And we read that, and if we're honest with our own lives, we say, is that kind of hope available for us? Can we be made real again? Can the image of Christ be restored in us? Well, then you've got Lucy. And they come to this island. And it's an island of voices. And the voices are very confusing and so on, but they don't see the voices. And they've got sharp spears. There's enough to make them nervous there. And they don't know what kind of army they have to fight. They're going to find out later that these people are really confused. They're, they're, they're monopods, but they call themselves duffelpods. They can't even get their own identity right. And I think they're very much like we human creatures. But they want to be made visible again. And the magician of that island, the governor of that island, has cast a spell upon them to make them invisible. And the only way the spell could be set right is if a little girl would go into the magician's house and in the library on the second floor read the spell that would make them visible again. And Lucy, brave and courageous as she is, she says, oh, I'll go read the spell. And she goes into the magician's house. And they're invisible. Is the magician invisible? There's a nervousness about it. There's some anxiety. And she makes her way up this winding stair. And she gets to the library. And she comes in and she sees the big book. And it's on a sort of a, 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 a platform, a table-like, leaned up and so on. And she has to face the book with her back towards the door. And she says it was, it was nerve-wracking. She tried to open the book, and she couldn't do it. And then all of a sudden, she sees it has a clasp. And she undoes the clasp, and she opens this book. And she said, it had a nice smell. And when you touched it, your fingers would tingle. And the letters were written in calligraphy with thick downstrokes and thin upstrokes. And she saw the margins were illuminated. And the duffel puds didn't know where to tell her to find the spell, so she had to go all the way through this book. And she would turn the pages, and she would read spells on how to take away warts, uh, how to make it rain after a drought, or how to make it drought after a long rain, or how to collect a swarm of bees. And all of a sudden, she sees the illuminated manuscript. It shows a man collecting a swarm of bees, and it's animated. And she goes on reading how to give a man a donkey's head like they did to Bottom in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream and so on. And finally she comes to a spell, how to make one more beautiful than the lot of mortals. And she looks at the illumination and she sees a girl like herself standing on a chair in front of a book. And she was not the most attractive of the Pevensey girls. Everybody noticed Susan, and she sees Susan over here, and she sees people looking at her, and then she sees this girl who looks like Lucy looking at the book, and all of a sudden she sees the girl saying something, and all of a sudden she becomes incredibly beautiful, and everybody leaves Lucy, uh, Susan to look at her. And pretty soon people start fighting over her honor, and armies are sent, and ships are launched. It's like Helen of Troy. And she says, I'm going to say that spell. And just as she starts to say it, the face of Oslong comes out of the page at her. And she quickly turns the next page. And there's a spell, how to listen into what your friends are saying about you when you're not there. And have you ever had a thing where, by the grace of God alone, you escape some temptation? And then the next little thing comes on, and you think you deserve that one? 
Well, she just jumps right into this one, both feet, and she just says this spell to listen in on what her friends are saying when she's not there. And unfortunately, she overhears a conversation where her arch enemy at school goads her best friend and goads her and goads her and goads her until she finally says something bad about Lucy. And Lucy's heart breaks and she weeps and she can't break free of it. And she's so angry and so broken and so sad. And in that sadness, she turns the page and there's a spell for the refreshment of the spirit. And it goes on for three pages. And when she comes to the end of it, she says, I've never read a story like that before. Wow. She says, I have to go back and read it again. And she sees that all the words begin to disappear on the page. And in this book, from that story, you can only go forward. You can never go back. And she says, what was it about? What was it about? Oh, yeah, it was about a green hill and a tree and a cup and a sword. And it went for three pages. And from that time on in her life, whenever she thought about a good story, she thought about that story for the refreshment of the spirit in the magician's book. She turns the page, and the next story is how to make things that were invisible visible again. And she speaks it, and when she does, Aslan's right next to her. She says, Aslan, how did you get here? He says, oh, I've been here all along, dear heart. <laughs> did you think I wouldn't obey my own laws? He says, you've been listening in where you shouldn't have listened. And she asks if it will ever be different. And he says, you never know what it might have been. You only get to know what it will become. He says, now come with me, dear heart. Let us meet the master of this house. And she says, oh, Aslan. Will you ever tell me again the story that I read for the refreshment of the spirit? Oh, do, 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 she says. And he says, dear heart, that's one story. I will tell you over and over and over again as long as we live. What was that story? The first story, to make one more beautiful than the lot of mortals, to exalt oneself over everybody else, that's the story of the fall. Her participation in the fall is listening in on what others said about her. And the spell for the refreshment of the spirit was a gospel story. The hill, Calvary, the tree, the cross, the cup that he drank, the sword, the death that he died. Goes on for three pages. You can always go forward. You can't go back from that story. And then all of a sudden, th things start becoming visible again. Look how he does that with a story, Lewis. And it touches our heart. And it gets to us. Lewis constantly writes about the quest for God. And it's different and it's different manifestations, whether it be pilgrim longing or the longing to have the brokenness healed. But then he also writes this in his stories, uh, what he talks about explicitly and propositionally in the weight of glory. There are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. All people are moving, like he describes in, in The Great Divorce, either towards horrors, the likes of which you only see in your worst nightmares, or beauties, the likes of which, if you saw them as they would one day be, you'd be tempted to fall down and worship them. And he says, the weight of glory is that we each have the responsibility. And we are helping people towards one of those ends or the other. And he's writing about this in his story, as you see what different characters have to find themselves doing in the various books. We could describe many examples, but I just want to go back to the one. Who was it that played Father Confessor to Edmund when he came back to tell the story about how Aslan had released him from his dragon state and made him boy again? Do you remember who it was in the stories? It was Edmund. Edmund. The one who had betrayed his siblings. And Aslan had to give up his life to save Edmund. And Edmund now is deployed to be the Father Confessor to Eustace. Oh, and what happens to Eustace in the next book? The Silver Chair. It is Eustace who is deployed to go and find Prince Rillian, the lost son of King Caspian, who has been under the spell of a witch. And he has to go and rescue the king's son and help him discover his true identity as a son of a king. 